Hi, uh, pleasure to be here. Hello, uh, YouTube and Chicago. Let me just pull up the presentation. Uh, but yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a recent article uh, investigation from Bloomberg News that uh, I worked on with Davy Alba and Leonardo Nicoletti. Um, there's a link to it right here. But I'm going to be pretty much walking through most of it. But I hope you'll read it, which uh, contains like our methodology. And so, uh, yeah, uh, I'm an investigative data journalist. That means I work on um, kind of longer term stories with a uh, you know hypothesis or data angle. And I'll talk a little bit about it today. So I like to start off with um, kind of an overview of our findings, and then I'll break down how we got there. So we found that OpenAI's GPT. 3.5 and 4 discriminates against names based on race and gender when asked to rank equally qualified resumes. So we basically ran 1,000 rank experiments using um, about 800 demographically distinct names. And we asked GPT to uh, rank those near identical resumes for uh, four real job roles from Fortune 500 companies um, for a financial analyst, a software engineering role, a retail position, and an HR role. We found that GPT not only treated these, uh, you know, resumes from different name uh, groups, demographics differently, but the differences were so large that it surpasses uh, adverse impact benchmarks, which are used to identify discriminatory hiring practices. So um, this talk is going to be about thirty minutes, and so I'll spend about five on the background, most of it on the methodology, and more discussion. You can read the link there. Uh, the paywall is down and you just have to provide a login, but I can also send a gift article also so that you can all read it uh, without having to um, uh, create an account. So a little bit of the background, um, our work, oh yeah. So, um, you know, over the last decade, it's been kind of apparent that uh, bias algorithms is 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 the norm and that wasn't that wasn't the case previously um you know when Sophia Noble who's a professor in, at a I think now she's at UCLA wrote her uh you know book algorithms oppression uh the, the sense that you know technology is neutral was kind of given but we're increasingly seeing that it's not the case there are so many examples just in Detroit uh, there's a man who was wrongfully arrested due to a faulty facial recognition uh of his face and uh, there's many other cases. And so um, I'd, I'd argue that, you know, biased technology predates, you know, uh, computers. And even, you know, when you think about when cars uh, were created, there were disproportionate fatalities for a few passengers because seatbelts weren't designed the same way. And so as technology advances and bias takes on new forms, how can we measure that? And so uh, when I started at Bloomberg about, you know, eight months ago, um, I was really interested in trying to figure out uh, how we can actually measure bias for generative AI, especially in a high stakes context. And so that was our original kind of direction that we wanted to take. And what we found very quickly was that generative AI is being used um, by HR vendors and um, uh, uh, you know human resources individuals to uh, try to uh, to screen and interview job candidates using chatbots. And so these are all actual marketing materials. So the top left is from LinkedIn, where now they have a uh, you, you know free form search where you can paste a job description or just kind of casual description. It'll filter through, you know, all of LinkedIn's candidates or just the candidates uh, for a specific job that you're already looking at. Um, there are others that uh, actually will ask screening questions, um, kind of like as a you know a, through text exchange before uh, to screen out candidates. <clears throat> Many of these tools are built using OpenAI's GPT and they're sold as such. So these are uh, one company actually sells it as a chat GPT for recruiters. And um, and one thing that, you know, we kept seeing throughout these marketing materials is the idea of um, removing bias or objectivity. In fact, uh, many Americans have this belief that, you know, AIs would actually be more objective than humans. So this is a survey from the Pew Research Center uh, from last year that found about half of people thought that AI would do a you know, better job than humans at treating all applicants the same. 
And when we talk to researchers like Emily Bender from University of Washington, who's a computational linguist, they told us about this term called um, automation bias, in which uh, due to uh, you know, algorithms uh, nature, we tend to think that they are uh, correct and objective even when they're not. This is a big point in uh, Ifama uh, Ajunwa's new book, The Quantified Worker, and something that we found in our reporting that um, bias doesn't really disappear, it's just hidden and laundered through these algorithmic systems. In order to carry out our study, we built off several landmark academic studies. Uh, so the first is from two economists in 20, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 200, uh, <laughs> 2003, sorry, I'm, where am I, what year am I? Uh, and what they did is they s assigned uh, demographically distinct names for uh, black and white candidates to fictitious resumes and sent them to real hiring firms. And what they found uh, by, after looking at callback rates are that employers discriminate against names. And this work has been repeated uh, numerously and as recently as uh, 2022. Uh, and you know that most recent study was actually a, a joint project between University of Chicago and uh, 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 Berkeley. Just the other day, uh, the upshot from the New York Times did this uh, piece digging into a follow-up work from those same researchers in which um, they show kind of a discrimination scorecard for each company uh, that they audited and looked at the callback rates. Due to these results, uh, many job seekers in the U.S. changed their names on resumes mainly due to discrimination concerns. And that was a, a survey again from uh, Greenhouse looking at job seekers. We were also inspired by Latanya Sweeney, a computer scientist at Harvard, who uh, Googled her own name in Google uh, and found that there was a disproportionate uh, and found um, ads suggestive arrest. And she found that this was the case um, for many uh, distinctly um, black names compared to white counterpart names. And so we take elements of both um, the audit study, sending fictitious resumes and looking at callbacks, uh, and also, you know, sending in names and seeing how an algorithm will treat those names. And so we combine those two in our work. And so our hypothesis that we tried to seek through our reporting and experiment is, uh, does GPT discriminate based on names when ranking resumes? And so here's how we did it. The first thing are the, our inputs. We generated 800 demographically distinct names um, for uh, Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, men and women. So about 100 for each of those eight intersectional groups. And we did that using publicly available data sets and combining two. So we, gen we got first names from North Carolina voter records, which are publicly available and contain demographic information. And from there, we got the, uh, we calculated which names had the greatest share for each uh, demographic group. And we ranked those names. And we picked the uh, most distinct and most popular 100. And then we randomly matched that with 20 of the most distinct, same calculation, the share of last names uh, from the US Census Bureau, because they keep track of um, last names or surnames uh, and the demographics of those with them. So uh, we combine these sources to create um, kind of fictitious names. But, you know, if talking to researchers, their explanation is essentially like, if you're going to pick someone off the street with one of these names, there's an extremely high likelihood that they would have a, um, a racial and ethnic group that matches um, the name in that data. And so we did this uh, specific method for black and white names and for Asian and Latino names or Hispanic names, we just picked the most popular first names and the most distinct last names because last names are a little more telling than first names in those cases. So that's our input. And uh, we also had the resumes. So for each of the four jobs, we generated eight nearly identical resumes with GPT-4, and then we edited them so that they had almost identical qualifications. And so what that means are the total years of experience the last job title, the educational background, both the school and the major, remove things like objectives and personal statements. And then uh, to each of those resumes, we randomly assigned one name uh, from each of the demographic groups, right? And so uh, for each ranking experiment, we showed show GPT um, one resume with a different name from a different group out of eight, and we asked to rank that. We repeat that 1,000 times for each job. 
here or for transparency here are the prompts we use and so um we basically say rank the eight resumes and here are the eight resumes and we also have kind of a systems message. It was kind of like a super prompt um, explaining kind of the criteria. And most importantly, the reference job description from a real job to compare against. And so uh, we repeat this a thousand times. This is a simulation, uh, including real data of uh, what it looks like. So this left side are who gets top ranked and the right is who gets bottom ranked. And this is the actual results for a financial analyst. And we were able to aggregate those results and look at how uh, GPT ranked everybody. And so, you know, because there are eight resumes and they're all shown in GPT at the same rate, right? Uh, we, you know, equal treatment would be about one out of eight, right? Maybe uh, 12 and a half. And so we compared that threshold to how GPT actually treated um, uh, each demographic group for those 1,000 different, you know, ranking scenarios that we ran. And so for financial analysts, we found the starkest disparities in which uh, names that are distinct to Black Americans were disproportionately, uh, you know, the least likely to be the top ranked out of the eight for those 1,000 runs. And so one question you might have is, um, are these uh, significant results? Is the gap substantial? Uh, and to calculate that, we use this metric that I mentioned earlier called adverse impact, which is used both in housing and hiring to look at disparate treatment, um, aka uh, discriminatory practices. And to do that, you take um, the highest rate. So in this case, Asian women were the top ranked 17.2% of the time. And you divide uh, the rate that each other group was treated by 17.2, by the best treated group. And you see if the difference is um, less than 0.8, it's sort of like a margin of error to know if the gaps are substantial enough. And it's a standard that's been used uh, since, I believe since you know Title VII passed from the uh, Civil Rights Act. And so this is a visualization of the same data set for adverse impact, right? And so the top group is 100% because you divide 17.2 by 17.2 and then the rest uh, fall in place. And so we see for black men that they were, uh, you know, 44% as often to be picked the top relative to the best treated group. And so every group here to the um, left of that line in that gray zone are considered to be adversely impacted. One thing that I want to underscore is that GPT's bias isn't one directional across the board, but varies based from job to job. And so um, a counter example to this, or like in a supplementary example you can consider, is looking at HR specialists in which GPT largely preferred women to this role. And although some women, like uh, some demographic groups, were um, still treated better than equal treatment, relative to the best performing group, they're still considered adversely impacted, which are denoted by those kind of hashed off um, boxes. Another thing that I want us to uh, drive home is that uh, our sample size is four. So we only looked at four different jobs. And so um, I would kind of avoid generalizing the patterns of GPT's bias across the entire youth workforce. Um, our experiment was just to see if they would be treated differently and enough so to uh, uh, surpass adverse impact benchmarks for which for all four jobs we looked at were in fact, uh, there was at least one adversely impacted group. So, um, you know, why does this happen? Um, one reason, uh, one way that we can trace this is looking again at those inputs, the names. The only things that are treated differently uh, are the names. And so the way that language models such as OpenAI's GPT view names and other such texts are called embeddings. There are numerical representations that these models learn uh, to basically represent uh, different, you know, characters, text, in this case, names. And they're based largely uh, or entirely on how those names appear in natural language. And so what we did is we were able to get the embeddings for all 800 of the names in our experiment. And they first were returned in like, you know, thousands of dimensions. So that's impossible to visualize. But we used an algorithm called UMAP, which is similar to principal component analysis, in which we're able to retain those relationships 
um, while uh, reducing the dimensionality in order to plot it. And so <clears throat> this scatter chart is of uh, the embeddings of all the names. And what you'll notice is that um, across race ethnicity, they are uh, uh, segregated and they are closely clustered within each name. And so um, although this might seem kind of common sense to people who you know, are familiar with NLP and computer science, um, these small differences, which could be as small as whatever latent space this is, is enough to lead to statistical bias and differences in how GPT uh, treats uh, different you know, resumes and hiring settings. So one thing that uh, I think is really important to do for all work, but especially for, you know, investigative journalism is to try to bulletproof your work. So that usually means like how to preempt things like, did you consider this? Um, and actually trying to disprove your hypothesis rather than try to prove it. And so to do that, we tried several ways to kind of um, debunk our findings. And one of them includes a popular academic paper by researchers at Anthropic who make a competing product called Claude. Uh, and so what they found is that if you use prompt engineering, uh, you can greatly reduce discriminatory outcomes simply by stating that discrimination is illegal. And so we repeated our experiment uh, while adding that to the prompt to say, hey, don't forget that discrimination is legal, so please don't discriminate. Um, and uh, so, you know, can you prompt engineer your way out of bias? Uh, we told GPT don't discriminate uh, for the financial analyst role, uh, that, which did not change the results. We also checked uh, to tell GPT to just straight up ignore names. That also didn't change results. And many readers suggested just simply removing the names. And uh, I'd argue that that defeats the purpose of the experiment since we're purposely doing an audit study to see if names are treated differently. Um, however, in practice, in many HR applications, they do remove names. And I think it's called a blind review. But in any case, all these solutions of prompt engineering puts the onus on users. Right, so you completely skirts accountability for the creators of these technologies, such as OpenAI, uh, and you know, <laughs> uh, puts us in the ballpark. And so, obviously, you know, as a user, you should be informed. But uh, I really don't think that that quite cuts it. Researchers we talked to, including Abeba Bahrain, a researcher from Mozilla, argues that the idea of debiasing is facade. And so, um, this researcher has spent a lot of time looking at training data and the bias embedded and how it percolates into systems and. Um, this could be no more apparent, uh, this could be very apparent you know, in recent-ish examples like looking at uh, Gemini, which was uh, returned uh, ahistoric results because they had tampered with the uh, generator algorithm to make it more diverse. And so, you know, as a way to, you know, I won't say too much because this isn't my reporting, but uh, it's something that comes to mind. One thing that um, I'm really proud of is uh, our involvement of uh, researchers and academics in this field to bulletproof our work and provide comments. And so we thank Dine Metaxa from University of Pennsylvania and Piotr Sapienzinski from Northeastern. Uh, they both are experts at algorithmic bias and employment practices. And uh, here are editors, Sarah Fryer, Chloe Whitaker, Seth Biegerman. Um, all of our data and in code, including how we collected it, analyzed it, um, the granular data is all available on GitHub. Um, this is the first GitHub repo that Bloomberg has published in, I think, three years. So I, I worked at the Markup previously, which is a nonprofit um, that focuses on data journalism for tech accountability, and we do this every time. And so um, we're trying to, you know, bring this practice to larger newsrooms and make it common, um, especially in this kind of experimental journalism in which we're actually, you know, conducting a, an experiment. What's really neat is that uh, independently, uh, academics approach the same problem. Uh, so this is a researcher from Ghent University in Belgium, and um, they read our work and reached out and said, hey, um, I, this is crazy, but I did something very similar and had almost identical results. And so it's really confirming uh, and, and, you know, relieving to see that, uh, you know, we, it was not a fluke. And, uh, you know, several upcoming papers also have similar approaches. Um, so this is the discussion section. I'll be pretty fast because I'm running out of time. But, you know, you might want to ask, like, how is this even allowed? Uh, and if you look at OpenAI's policies, they say that you know you shouldn't use OpenAI to uh, make high stakes automated decisions, such as employment. And the key here, uh, and we reached out to email, uh, you know, with our results and with questions ahead of time, and they're specifically you know hammering this idea of like automated decisions. And so um, that what that means is if 
a the AI makes a decision completely without any human involvement, right? And so, um, and also that the companies comply with the law. And so that's a that's a heavy caveat that um, we see often with different uses of technology in high stakes environments, in which you know they claim that human involvement kind of surpasses that nudge. And also note that hiring discrimination, whether or not it's algorithmic or otherwise, is incredibly hard to prove and has been historically. And so we talked to Pauline Kim, who is an employment ex uh, lawyer from University of Washington, St. Louis. And she, she told us that it's so difficult because the onus lies on individuals to basically recognize what's going on. And, um, uh, and oftentimes that's just not gonna happen because uh, it's not apparent why someone was not hired. Right. That's not only the case, uh, you know, analog, but, uh, you you know, in the job process, you probably don't know if a you know automated tool is being used on you. But this is something that the Equal Opportunity Commission is considering. Uh, just last year, they had a hearing with a bunch of experts, including many of the people we spoke to in this investigation about artificial intelligence and hiring. And um, so they're going to continue looking at this topic um, and also. Um, in order to help you if you're in the job hunt, um, the ACLU has this great guide called Know Your Rights Digital Discrimination and Hiring, in which they have a bunch of tells that you can use to see if um, during the interview process, any of these automated tools are being used. There are also a slew of um, state or city level laws that also grant uh, uh, you know, job seekers rights to you know, ask what's being used and see how um, other candidates have been treated. And I think that that's the real uh, big takeaway is that, you know, even if you as an individual um, are denied a job, you can only really prove discrimination, uh, you know, when you know how all others are treated, right? Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why it's just, uh, you're, you're not really going to see people litigate on this topic, even though there are so many laws to protect uh, job seekers. So uh, thank you so much. You know, uh, you can be doing anything tonight. So thank you for tuning in. And um, if you have tips on what I should report on next, please let me know. Um, here's my email and my signal username. Please feel free to reach out. Um, I cover all things AI uh, technology. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm still very interested in hiring, but, you know, many other topics as well. So um, thank you. And um, I'm happy to take some questions now. And um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Leon. Um, yeah, we have some questions for you. Um, so uh, one question is, um, since this has been published, has there been any response either from makers of LLM models or companies that are using this hiring or potential workers or job seekers? Has anyone responded specifically to the publishing of this information? Um, not yet. So this was just out for like a month and I'm still waiting to hear the impact. Uh, there's sometimes pieces where I have immediate impact, but uh, you know, I'm still ear to the floor waiting to hear uh, how this how uh, this is being received by others. But um, as far as all the companies uh, involved that we reported on, they all gave us statements like when we reported this and then uh, swiftly have been, uh, you know, trying to, you know, ignore its existence. So, but thank you for that question. Sure. Yeah. Um, a question from the audience. Um, uh, given that this, you know, was sort of data-driven experimental research uh, and reporting, um, do you or other journalists at Bloomberg or elsewhere have plans to uh, look at real-life examples of specific implementations of GPT in hiring? Oh, I would love to. Yes. I mean, the difficulty goes back to what Dr. Pauline Kim says and just like finding the proof and evidence that these systems are in use are very difficult and attaining the results and the data is also extremely difficult. Right. And so in the case that a, you know, public agency uh, might be using a technology like this, like that's something you probably FOIA for. Um, but for the most part, this is being used, uh, you know, by private industry. And so we're unlikely to find results from that. Um, of course, you know, <laughs> one of my dreams is actually to run a real live audit study sending fictitious resumes to real hiring firms in which, you know, we know are using this technology. However, um, the likelihood that I can get away with that as a journalist is, is very unlikely because, you know, as journalists, we have to always basically say that we're journalists. Um, that would be a dead giveaway in the resume <laughs> because we want to send fictitious resumes. And so, 
Um, I continue to, you know, have uh, my feelers out for different ways of approaching this topic. And if you have ideas about how I could do that, please reach out to me because uh, I'm very uh, eager to continue uh, exploring this, this topic. Sure. Um, another question we have is, um, I guess, around uh, strategies for how to mitigate this kind of bias. Um, if you're processing a large number of resumes, I guess, potentially, if you're in HR department doing this kind of hiring, um, are there strategies specifically to avoid this? Like, could you just take out names and um, automate removing the names and would that solve the problem? That is definitely above my pay grade, but um, uh, this is a question I get asked a lot. And um, it kind of goes back to the scale at which you're dealing with, right? So, you know, if you have a few dozen applicants, I think it's completely fine to either do that with software or an intern and then just look at everything manually. But I would say that um, one thing that is important to note is that different proxy variables bleed out all the time in resumes, right? Like certain affinity groups, even colleges, um, they can all reveal different socioeconomics, not just race, ethnicity, but um, sexual orientation, um, religion, age. And all of these are different, uh, you know, play different roles in implicit bias. Sure. So it's hard. Uh, <laughs> it's a hard, yeah. it's a hard problem. Right. Yeah. Hard. Um, this also is um, diverging a little bit uh, from the specific data in this, but do you, do you have information or or uh, an idea of you know related information on how virtual video interviews are handled internally by recruiters uh, or or pre recorded video? Oh yeah. So if your interview is being pre-recorded, there's almost a hundred percent likelihood that some sort of algorithm is being used to analyze it after the fact. Um, there are um, they're kind of like sentiment detection where they they like look at your tone and your facial cues. And so you know if your video is being recorded, I would just ask like how it's being analyzed and if they're retaining it. Um, you can always ask for accommodations for different interviews. And I think most laws, uh, at least some local laws, um, I think the ACLU report is a way better resource, talks about um, how you have the right to accommodations. And so, um, yeah, let's just let's just quickly go back to that. So I think I like, I show this, but I didn't really like, talk through. So like, anytime you're asked to record, um, and so this is all ACLU, this is not my reporting, um, but I, you know, I try to trust ACLU. So anytime you're asked to record a video or voice clip, um, you know, there's probably a system at play. If you have to deal with the chatbot, if your application is quickly or automatically rejected, tests and games um, are more common now, and those are definitely running algorithms to assess kind of judgment and other such latent qualities of person. Um, uh, yeah, and if you're, you know, sent to another website, then that's also the flag. So these are all things to keep an eye, eye out for. And, uh, you know, if you are uh, in the interview process and experience any of these things, please let me know. Uh, please let me know where you applied to and what you experienced, because there are a handful of vendors that make all these tools. Um, yeah, sure. I, I'll, I'll ask a, a quick follow up to that, which, you know, sure. as, as you know, I on the job hunt have certainly experienced virtually recorded, uh, you know, interview video interviews. And um, I'm curious uh if there's been any effort to explore how algorithms handle those and any implicit bias specifically in video analysis or sentiment sentiment analysis analysis as you referenced yes there is uh i think it was a german outlet did this really amazing uh kind of like video piece looking at video interviewing um i will try to find it and um i can comment it on the YouTube group. I don't think I'll be able to find it right now. I will give it a shot. Um, I won't give it a shot because I'm screen sharing, but um, oh, I, I wish I remembered the, uh, the publication. It's really good. But they proved that uh, the outcome, you know, I shouldn't say because I need to reread it, but I will try my best to share this back with the group. And um, I think it's a very telling assessment of how, um, you know, video assessment is kind of just like a Myers-Briggs, you know, um, Myers-Briggs is kind of just like a vibe test. And, you know, it's very easy to fail it arbitrarily and uh, people use it. Uh, it's kind of like pseudoscience. And so, um, you know, I'm not going to say that all these tools are pseudoscience, but 
Uh, I will say that they are similar to things that we know are pseudoscience, <laughs> like Myers Briggs. Inside that analysis. Yeah. 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 If you have a link to that, you can share it on the YouTube comments or uh, send it to uh, any of us at Chat Hack Night and we'll share it in the Slack. Um, uh, another question from the audience. Um, so given what you were saying about uh, like affinity groups and other uh, demographic information on a resume, would it be reasonable to assume that uh, ChatGPT or other automated algorithm-based hiring um, would be similarly biased or discriminate against, for, say, for example, an applicant who had attended a historically Black college? So, uh, you know, I, I can't speculate since I haven't looked into it, but um, I think what our study shows is that the sensitivity to a name alone is enough to push, uh, you know, disproportionate treatment to, to groups consistently. And that's after we controlled for all the other variables. But there's certainly latent information in all those other variables that also will, you know, lead to nudges in certain directions. And so um, some great follow-up work for, you know, the public out there is to repeat this, but, you know, maybe keep the names the same and change things like colleges, right? Uh, and other such, uh, you know, additional tidbits of information. Because by fixing some variables and, you know, looking at difference to the others, I think that's how you kind of narrow in on the, the influence. And so um, these kinds of kind of isolated audit studies can tell us a lot about how these decisions are made, even though they're, you know, highly idealized. But it's enough to, you know, show the, you know, the, the possible effects. So I think that they're valuable for that reason. Sure. Uh, and, and given that your uh, source code is available, um, I suppose one could do that. Um, yes. <laughs> for, for, um, speaking of, um, uh, you mentioned open sourcing the code and making it available. Um, are there other practices from the markup as kind of a specialized outlet or that uh, you've used or encountered elsewhere that you'd like to see adopted at other outlets when covering tech and algorithms? Yeah, um, I think one is being really clear about the methodology and um, how you count things and, you know, the, the the inputs, right? And so oftentimes there are charts that are gotten from data vendors and you don't really know how that data is collected, if it's done, you know, ethically or with consent um, or what it really means, right? And I think that oftentimes um, we use kind of proxy variables to um, look at an outcome or, you know, categorization schemes to, uh, you know, talk about something like, let's say, like fake news or, um, you know, disinformation, right? So these are all labels, but you should really ask how that label really aligns with what you're looking at. And I think a lot of what I do is spending time to make sure that, you know, my methods and the words that I use are really aligned with the data that, that we're looking at. I should also add that, you know, if you're curious about um, how to do these investigations, I have an online uh, resource that I work on with um, an academic named Piotr who uh, reviewed this article called inspectelement.org. And um, it includes kind of how I approach these investigations, like the questions that I ask, and also um, how to, you know, build your own data sets, which I think is one of the most important keys to um, asking these questions, right? So like a lot of open source data sets are helpful, um, but many of them uh, are created with a purpose that maybe won't cover a very important question that you're interested in asking. And so being able to, you know, find your own data sets and ask those questions, you know, from scratch is extremely powerful. And um, something that I hope not only journalists will do, but other, you know, civic technologists, public interest technologists, who just want answers and have, you know, a little bit too much time <laughs> like me uh, um, or just curious. And so, um, you know, this is our first post is about finding undocumented APIs and uh, it includes, you know, case studies like the one I walked through and, you know, why we use these tech, these tools and then, you know, a tutorial about how to do it yourself. And so, um, you know, if you're curious about, you know, the underlying, you know, you know, techniques that I use um, please check this out and, you know, let me know what you think, if it's helpful. Um, I'll, I frequently, you know, I was actually in Chicago last year giving this exact tutorial at a conference. And so, um, you know, people get a lot out of it and I hope that you all will too, if you, if you, you know, are interested. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing that resource. Um, on uh, the similar topic, um, there's a question. Um, uh, how long did it take you to perform this investigation and, and do this study? And, and then as kind of a follow-up, given what you've produced and what's available on GitHub, uh, you know, how long would it conceivably take to replicate the study, but with some different variables? It took about, it took months. So somewhere between three to five months, I'd say, because um, it's hard to gauge because sometimes we're waiting to hear feedback or like get approval to do things. But um, I'd say it's about like, you know, three to five months of full time from me and, you know, Davey. And then Leo spent, um, you know, you know, you know, two months of his time or more to create those uh, beautiful graphics. And so, um, but, you know, to replicate it, I think, you know, you could do it quite quickly, right? Like we have the names, um, you know, if you want to take names, so we have the resume templates. Um, so I think we have like the blueprint. And so I think you could, you could, you know, you can get that up and running in a few hours and you could, you know, I think, you know, getting something up, you know, as I'm sure many of your coders here, and you probably can sympathize that, you know, getting code to run kind of well can be done fast, but like being deliberate about, you know, what it all goes towards and making sure it's the right application takes a lot longer, right? And so I think a lot of it is um, time spent, like making sure that, you know, again, what we're measuring is what we think we're measuring, that's aligned and that it, you know, as reporters that it follows what our, you know, interview subjects are telling us and what we're not just, you know, seeing what we want to see. And so, um, yeah, I think you could, if you take a look at the GitHub, um, yeah, let me know if it's useful and you know, I'm happy to answer questions. I'd love to see it. Sure. Yeah, build um, work. yeah, a question I had was, have you had a response to that GitHub being available? Are, are people looking at it? Are people engaging with it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I saw a few readers be like, I didn't trust you. And then I saw the GitHub and it's actually pretty good. Now I trust you. And that was really funny to see. Um, uh, I'll also say that having a methodology um, is nice. So like at the markup, we'd have like 30 page methodologies here. It's like a one pager or maybe even less. But, you know, part of the story, you know, which I hope you all have the time to dig into because there's so much more in it, um, is actually about the methodology and our choices. And I think having that be part of the narrative is really important. Um, and I think that's something that I think we should all think about as people who are trying to, you know, communicate complex topics, right, about how to you know, combine storytelling, right? And the technical bit, at least of what people need to know and, uh, and you know, visuals and all that uh, to, to really communicate it. And so that in itself is a challenge that I think is really worthy uh, to, to, you know, invest time in. Yeah, that's great. A um, uh, question from the audience. Um, are there any plans uh, to look beyond the, the four roles you looked at and are there any roles you would be particularly interested in looking at? Yes, I mean, I think off the bat, um, well, I'll say that we don't have plans on running this in a bigger sense. Like as journalists, uh, you know, we try to to start the conversation or, you know, end a conversation. In this case, I think this is a conversation starter. Um, but I hope that, you know, this template can be used and you can find, um, you know, dozens of jobs to look at, um, you know, get the job description, make the resumes and it could be run again. And then you can see what those patterns are. Oh, I will say that some researchers have, you know, pretty much repeated this experiment with different jobs and come to same, same conclusion, similar conclusions. So um, I'm always keen to see, um, you know, how that scales. Yeah. Um, we have an audience question. Um, uh, do you get the sense that there is, you know, interest or demand for a tool that makes it easier to test this kind of bias in different models uh, across different situations? Um, uh, yeah, so like this is a classic kind of research question about benchmarking bias, and it remains unsolved. There are a few, there's something that Anthropic uses called BBQ, which uh, I think is has a bunch of kind of stereotypical questions, and it kind of looks at how you know, stereotype biased the answers are from large language models. And so I think that that's an active line of inquiry, uh, definitely in the academic field and likely by the creators of these models. Um, 
But I think the, the difficulty with bias is that there's so many different kinds of bias. And what really matters to me is like outcomes and like how that bias might affect someone. And so we were quite deliberate about the design of our experiment to reflect a real world setting, right? Like people are actually using, you know, GPT or language models to write resumes and seeing how that would affect people, right? And so I think one big thing that, you know, I think I try to think about is how, you know, that bias, you know, testing that bias in a way that's the most similar to the real world application in a way that would uh, actually, you know, tangibly harm someone. So there's a lot of like kind of theoretical bias. Like, I, you know, you might've seen things like, uh, tell me a story about like, um, you know, a doctor and a nurse named like Jim and Linda, and then you see who's Jim and who's Linda, right? And, but those are kind of more theoretical, right? And so um, there's many different ways to measure bias. Um, but as journalists, I think that we kind of prioritize those that are like, you know, as close to real world uh, or and, and our real world as possible. Got yeah, it. thanks for that question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of addressed this, but some follow-up questions from the audience. Um, is is there increasing demand uh, for the testing of this bias? And um, do you see potentially what that bias looks like shifting across time or different language models? Not specific to language models, but there is a cottage industry of algorithm auditors that's approaching, uh, that is like growing, especially in uh, jurisdictions that have these kind of like localized laws about, you know, um, uh, like AI and hiring or AI and fairness. And so um, I, I don't really remember, I think the demand is growing. Uh, but what's I think important is to make sure that um, that demand is addressed uh, in a way that you know actually you know doesn't just rubber stamp things. But you know I sh you know shouldn't go into you know conjecture and opinion. But uh, uh, short answer is uh, I do think uh, it is growing for uh, better or for worse. Sure. Um, yeah. A question I had is you know uh, if there's evidence or you know published um research and studies going back so many years about historically biased hiring um and you know llms like chat gpt are built off of essentially scraping existing data um is there a strategy that if one is making an llm one could do to avoid repeating the bias in the existing hiring data so you know I think that this is assuming that um, bias is like a one-to-one, -one, like, you know, you have bias outcomes in hiring, the system will reflect that. But I'd argue that um, bias is deeply embedded uh, in many ways. And for the scale of data required to train these systems, I don't think you're able to curate it so perfectly in which you can kind of erase those deeply ingrained biases uh, from mm -hmm. the training data. It uh, just, it doesn't seem feasible, at least from what I can imagine, uh, the scale necessary to, to build the technology and, you know, the source of that text, uh, that data. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we have, uh, a question. Um, if you're part of a group that, you know, you think might be uh, ad adversely affected, um, while trying to apply for a job. Um, uh, well, there's a question. Um, is using a large language model to help you less effective than if you're not adversely framed? Uh, I, I don't think I understand the question. Yeah. Um, Sorry. So I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm reading this audience question here. So um, if you're if you're part of a group that's adversely affected um, in the context of ChatGPT hiring, um, uh, I, I suppose one version of this question is, what can you do about it? Um, and, and, and another question is, um, uh, if you're trying to use ChatGPT um, to apply for jobs, which I've you know personally seen recommended you know, use ChatGPT to make your cover letter, use ChatGPT to 
uh, format your resume to fit this job description, um, how might the bias play out there as well? Uh, let, let me answer this one time. So, yeah. you know, how you might be affected, I would probably default to that ACLU um, digital discrimination uh, handbook to see uh, the kinds of, again, the questions you can ask. And uh, it, there's also a link to um, state level laws that, you know, could and state level laws that could apply to you, which, you know, could afford you, uh, you know, different lines of inquiry. Um you know, another thing that's, you know, le lo more low tech is just, you know, being organized with, you know, if you have colleagues who are also, uh, or friends who are also applying the same job, just, job, just hearing about their experience. Um, but again, it's really it, like the scale at which this operates is really hard at, for individuals to, uh, to have kind of um, agency over, which is unfortunate. Um, to the other side of the question of, you know, using, you know, generative AI to, to like help, um, this is an endorsement, but I know that there are, you know, tech companies that um, do that. They like help write job descriptions uh, for people hiring. They probably also help you, you know, write resumes, but um, it's really hard to say, right? It, like it depends on where you're applying and what systems they use. If they're screen, you know, mo a lot of times if you're applying online, they'll screen for keywords. It's called a Boolean search. That's old school and that's still kind of the main thing that's happening and they're searching for kind of like um, skills or, you know, other such things. And so um, there's many conspiracy theories about how to kind of like hack your way through that. And I don't know, you know, many, you know, recruiters we talked to said that, you know, they're all kind of big. So, I mean, the advice that I'll give you if you're like, and this is my personal opinion, is like if you're looking for a job, the, the best way to get on someone's radar is to meet them in person. And so, you know, events like this group um, and others where there are people who might be presenting or, um, uh, you know, might be there just to meet them and talk to them and see if they have, you know, what they do. And so in, in my past, you know, especially when I was starting out, like I got my like first or second job, like by meeting the person and then um, I think so. I think that's the most effective. It's really hard given the, the you know, the volume at which um, you know, certain jobs get. And so then they have to use automation or they say they have to use automation. And so um, it's, it's just a very difficult, uh, it's, it's hard out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Leon, for the presentation and for answering all these questions. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, uh, give it up in the chat, you know. Um, <laughs> And uh, we are going to move uh, on to the civic hacking portion of the evening in three word intros. Um, so you can follow that Zoom link. Um, Leon, you're welcome to join us also if you want. But otherwise, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, so reach out. Everyone, reach out if you um, have questions or comments or have tips. Uh, take care. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Leon. Bye. Uh, and we'll have that uh, link to the Zoom in the chat, uh, and we'll see you there.